across the globe by satellite. Join us for Welcome to Grace, where we'll discover together the distinctiveness of Paul's apostleship through the rightly divided word of truth. Now, join pastor and Bible teacher, Kurt Christ, as we explore the unsearchable riches of Christ. Well, good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us. Welcome to Grace. Today we begin a brand new series within our study of the book of Romans, and we've entitled this series, A Journey Through the Bible. Uh, the title for our first lesson in our Journey Through the uh, Bible series, it will be called The Book of Truth, as you see there on the overhead. It makes little sense, in my opinion at least, to conduct a, uh, a study through the Bible without at the outset understanding some things about the Bible. So this is where we'll begin. Uh, we'll be so, sort of setting the stage for our Through the Bible study. And in that Through the Bible study, we'll begin with Genesis. and We'll work all the way through the Bible, uh, and I think you'll find some interesting things. And the Bible's a book like no other book on earth, and I think most of you folks already know that. The reason for that is because the Bible reveals the truth about God, uh, the creator of the universe, who he is. Um, what he's like as far as his attributes are concerned. In the Bible, we see God's works and we see God's ways along with his purpose and his plan for mankind down through the course of time. In the Bible, we find the dilemma of mankind and how uh, God remedied that dilemma. Uh, the Bible is truly the most amazing book that was ever written because the Bible is God's word to mankind. Uh, the most uh, sold book, we see that... Uh, uh, almost everyone says it's the, uh, the highest um, on the charts as far as the number of sales. Also the highest on the charts as far as the book that's been given away down through time. It's impossible to overstate the importance of it because of the importance that God places on it himself. God reveals that importance to us in Psalms 138 verse 2 where the psalmist wrote this, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name. For thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified, and here it is, thy word above all thy name. You may have noticed how the psalmist makes mention of God's truth in this verse. Because God's word is truth. Uh, it's just as John said in John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Uh, let's take a few minutes to talk about truth. Uh, what is truth anyway? Uh, have you ever really thought about the definition of the word truth? Uh, there are many things that can be said about truth. We talked about some of these things in an earlier study some years ago now. I was looking that up. It's been about six years in our study of Philippians. Uh, but truth has been called the great divider of men. And rightly so. Uh, truth is the opposite of something. It's the opposite of untruth or we might say falsehood. But how would you actually define the word truth itself? Uh, now if you haven't really research this, you don't know how complicated it can actually become. Uh, it's far easier to understand the concept than it is to define the word. Webster's 1828 Dictionary of the English Language defines truth this way, and I believe his current edition of the dictionary defines it much the same way. Truth is conformity to fact or reality. Truth is conformity to fact or reality. Exact accordance with that, with that which is, or has been, or shall be. Truth is conformity, conformity to fact or reality. Think about that for a moment. The problem is, when you look up the words fact and reality, you find that a circle emerges where one term is used to describe the other term, and it just keeps rotating. Uh, that's sort of like saying truth is truth because it is true. Uh, one term defining the other, but all true propositions are true. Which is how some actually define truth. All true propositions are true. Uh, you think philosophers have, uh, have debated over the issue of defining truth? Listen to some of these. There's the semantic conception of truth. The diamond theory of truth. The coherence theory of truth. The deflationary theory of truth. The identity theory of truth. The pragmatist theory of truth. The revision theory of truth. And the correspondence theory of truth. There are at least eight different theories concerning the definition of that word truth. Uh, believe me, a definition for truth has been debated for centuries. Tell me, is something true because science believes it to be true? Has science ever been wrong? I think we know <laughs> that it has. Is something true because many people 
Uh, perhaps even a vast number of people, we might even say the majority of people, believe it to be true. Um, I think we already know the answer to that question. Uh, the fellow with the first name of they and the last name of say uh, has been proven to be one of the biggest liars of all time. They say. Yet we hear it all the time, don't we? They say. That makes it right. Going back to Webster's definition, truth is conformity to fact or reality. But are facts and reality not subject to change? Uh, a truth one minute may, longer be, may no longer be a truth the next. Uh, that, this led one philosopher to conclude his search for a definition of truth with these two statements, or rules as he called them. Rule number one, everything is subject to change. Rule number two, the only thing in reality or imagination that is not subject to change is the fact that all things are subject to change. <laughs> did you catch what he just did there? Everything is subject to change. Everything. The only thing in reality that is not subject to change is that all things are subject to change. Ponder that for a while if you're, uh, if you're really anxious to, to, uh, to conduct an exercise in futility. You didn't have to be listening too closely to realize that rule number two is in direct contradiction to rule number one, which led another philosopher to this concluding statement. Since something that is true one moment may not be true the next, and since something that is true for me may not be true for you, all truth is relative. All truth is relative, really. <laughs> well, that's philosophy for you. Don't miss the thought line here, folks. This may not be what you think. Certainly something may true about or for me that's not true about or for you. It's true that I don't have a head full of hair. <laughs> some of you folks certainly do. But let me show you where some have taken the all truth is relative concept um, that, at which this philosopher arrived. This is what I call the new math approach to truth. Uh, in other words, truth is nothing more than what I choose to believe is true. Uh, that's where a lot of folks take it. If I believe something, then that which I've chosen to believe is truth is the idea that I want to share with you here. Uh, I don't believe that's true, but it's the idea that some have, uh, uh, have come to. Um, if truth is all relative, then my truth is simply my truth. It's true from my perspective. You can have your own truth, even if your truth, uh, we're speaking the same things, and your truth totally contradicts my truth. Um, really makes no difference is the mainstream thought today. Uh, you don't step on my truth, and I won't step on your truth is the notion. Both are equally valid truths. You catch the idea? Now, whatever you choose to believe on any matter is your truth. Just as what I choose to believe on any matter is my truth. This is where society is taking us today. And what right does anyone have to tell either of us that the truth we choose to hold is not truth? Why, what a marvelous concept for humanity. We can just arrive at whatever we want to arrive at, and there is no right and wrong because truth is relative. The Bible calls that every man doing that which is right in his own eyes. Everyone can simply, simply pick and choose his or her own truth. Isn't that wonderful? And by the way, it's polit politically correct at the same time. All truth relegated to the realm of relativity. Uh, to put the new math approach to truth in simple terms, which really isn't a new approach at all. It's a very old approach. There are no absolutes. And this is what's being taught our young people in schools across the land today. You see, without an appropriate definition of truth, this is precisely where human reasoning takes itself. There are no absolutes, none whatsoever, which ultimately means that good and evil are also relative. Uh, they are nothing more than what each person perceives them to be in his or her own mind. What belief system teaches this from time past? Anyone have an idea? Well, if you were with us through our study of Colossians, you know the answer. It's, uh, it was the Gnosticism of Paul's day, which is nothing more than the New Ageism, the New Age philosophy of our day. Both are based on the syncretized system called pantheism, which is the multiplicity of God's idea. Uh, polytheism would be many gods. Pantheism, everything is God. If we took the table, the chair, the floor, the air, the stars, the sky, the sun, the moon, and you, and wrapped it all up into a package and called it the one, pantheism would say, that's God. So who are you if you're part of the one? Well, you're part of God himself, according to the pantheist way of thinking. You have that good God spark down inside you, 
because you are God. You don't need saving. You never need save, saving according to the pantheist viewpoint. You need to be enlightened as to who you really are at the core of your being. The problem with that is the Apostle Paul says just the opposite. We're not good at the core of our being. We're evil at the core of our being. It's the sin nature that we all inherited through Adam. It's the concept as I like to think of it as myself a God is love. God is agape. God is other focused. Always doing what is in the best interest outwardly. But we have a disease called myself a And everything we do say here. All of our relationships are based on how something makes us feel. Did someone step on my toes or injure my ego? So we have that sin disease called myself a eh? Always bent toward thinking of self. And we can't get away from it. We didn't make a decision to get it. It was given to us through inheriting it by way of Adam. Uh, this, but this fits right in with how political correctness would have us view the, world, uh, the word tolerance today. The idea that all truth is relative. Therefore, good and evil are relative. Tolerance when it comes to right and wrong. Tolerance when it comes to uh, other viewpoints out there. Uh, other religious persuasions, let's say. Um, but especially, let's narrow it down to right and wrong. As some of us older folks knew that word tolerance, uh, we know that it has to do with acknowledging that there are different viewpoints in the world and allowing others to hold their viewpoints while we may uh, totally disagree with those viewpoints and hold steadfast to our own. Uh, we can look at another viewpoint and we can say wrong if we have convictions about our own viewpoint. Of course, according to the first commandment, uh, First commandment, commandment, according to the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, you have the right to voice your view either way, do you not? Well, don't bet the farm or don't bet your paycheck on that one. <laughs> Webster defines the word tolerate as many, of us, as many of us older folks knew it in our day. Tolerate to Webster. To recognize and respect others' beliefs, practices, and so on without sharing those beliefs. And to bear or put upon with someone or something not especially liked. That's the traditional definition and it's compatible with scripture. But as I, as I said, the word's been redefined today to make it politically correct. Our young people are being taught something entirely different than the way we learned to define tolerance. Uh, today, political correctness would have us believe that tolerance means that what other individuals do or say... Even if we hold a completely different conviction is equally as right and equally as valid as our own view. Did you catch the difference? Their view is as equally right and valid as our view. All values, when you think about it in that sense, all values, beliefs, lifestyles, and truth claims are equal. That's the new way to define the word tolerance. Uh, do you see the difference in the old tolerance and the new tolerance? Uh, G.K. Chesterton, the English author who, by the way, influenced C.S. Lewis in his writings, once said, tolerance is a virtue of a man without convictions. Uh, I like that. Listen to this quote by Josh McDowell. I think most of you know him. He's the author of Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Josh says, in order for a person to possess convictions about a belief, it is necessary by definition for the person to be convinced that his or her belief is true. But if I sincerely consider everyone's beliefs, lifestyles, and truth claims as equal to my own, even when they contradict my beliefs, lifestyle, and truth claims, I can no longer claim any genuine conviction regarding my own beliefs. Not if I consider theirs equal to mine, just different. The new tolerance requires me to admit that I may just as easily be as mistaken or misled as my neighbor. If no truth is more truth than any other truth, then there is no truth worth defending. You see where we take ourselves when we take the modern day approach, the politically correct approach to the word tolerance. And if there's no truth worth defending, there's no room for conviction. That's where it's going, folks. It's an interesting thing. No matter the time in history being examined, men have always had a problem when it comes to that word truth as, uh, as truth relates, especially as it relates to right and wrong. Uh, you see, men have always wanted to devise their own truth. Uh, Lucifer introduced the concept, that concept in the garden uh, back when he approached Eve. And he made this statement to Eve, ye shall be as gods, here it is, knowing good and evil. The idea being, not you shall just understand what is good and evil, 
the idea being you and Adam will be able to determine for yourselves that which you want to be good and that which you want to be evil. Uh, you won't need anyone else to make the determination as to what is right or what is wrong. You'll be able to decide that yourselves. Uh, well, Eve picked up the ball and she ran with it. Uh, she lateraled off to Adam and mankind's been running that same play ever since. Uh, every man doing that which is right in his own eyes. Sin, relative. Righteousness, relative. Judgment, relative. Truth, relative. We dare not step on anyone else's truth lest we offend those folks. Uh, their views are equally as valid as ours. Really. But that's what they'd have us believe today. And that's the opposite of what is now being defined as hate speech. Uh, which we have to avoid at all costs. Uh, so what about the First Amendment to the Constitution? Well, let's forget what I think. Let's forget what you think. How about truth from God's point of view? Does God have a definition of truth? Let's jump out of the truth definition circle for a moment. We've seen the difficulty men have had uh, trying to define it. And let's look at truth from God's perspective. What is the ultimate source of truth when it comes to what God wants us to know about ourselves and about him? Why, it's none other than the word of God. God is true. His word tells us. As John stated, thy word is truth. So John's just to find truth. Uh, so from God's point of view, his word, no matter the age, no matter the dispensation, is the ultimate source of truth. God can be nothing but truthful. That's who he is in his character. Webster said truth is conformity to fact or reality. We could say truth is that which is in agreement with God's word rightly divided. Now does God change? Well, of course he does. We know that God's character never changes. So how does he change? Well, if his character never changes, uh, when it comes to who God is and that which makes him God, we can say that it's a fundamental truth that God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. But we know that has to do with his attributes. That's what makes him God. He doesn't change in his attributes. That's a fundamental unchanging truth about who God is. However, the way that God has dealt with man down through the course of history has indeed changed. Uh, we know that what man has been called upon to believe has been progressively revealed down through history. And it's been revealed where? In the word of God. And that which man has been called upon to do or not do in connection with what he's been called upon to believe has also differed through time. We're not building arcs today. But that was a truth in time past, was it not? We're not building arcs, and we're certainly not toting our animal sacrifices to uh, altars of offering in the dispensation of the grace of God. If you rightly divide the word of truth, you know that water baptism is not for the remission of sins today, as it was in God's program with the nation Israel in time past. What was true, you see, in connection with the requirements of faith in one dispensation, and the Bible proves this to be true, are not necessarily true in connection with the requirements of faith in another dispensation. Truth for one age, some have said, is not necessarily truth for another age. Uh, but that doesn't change the fact that the ultimate source of truth for every age is found within the pages of the written word of God. This is why we must rightly divide it. Uh, I like to say if, if folks are building an ark, they're looking to another time and another program. And they're taking God's instruction for another man at another time and trying to apply it to themselves. We're not building arcs because that wasn't truth that was revealed to and for and about us. Uh, the Bible contains truth for time past and how God worked and dealt with men then. It contains truth for this uh, dispensation of grace. And it contains truth concerning things to come that are not yet here. Uh, that which is in agreement with God's word is truth. We simply must rightly divide it to understand what's happening and when. And this is why truth is the great d uh, divider of mankind, the great divider of men. Anywhere the word of God is proclaimed, you will find controversy and division. Uh, what Paul's going to illustrate in uh, a four-verse section that I intend to show you this morning, 1 Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians, um, is that men have always had a problem with accepting the word of God, no matter the dispensation, as truth. It shouldn't surprise us then that men have a problem with accepting Paul's epistles as being the fundamental truth for today, as he is the apostle of who? The Gentiles. Um, at issue is either the acceptance of or the rejection of truth. 
the truth of God. There's no neutral ground. Um, when what God is telling us in his word is truth. Now, this is why truth is indeed the great divider of men, as I said. Anytime you see the truth of God proclaimed, as we said, you will see controversy and you will see division. One might ask, does the word of God cause the division? Think back with me for a moment. Does the word of God itself cause the division? What did Christ say? What were his words during his earthly ministry to the nation Israel, a Jew under law, teaching Jews under law? Do you recall what Christ told his disciples in Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 and 35? Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I, I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Look as he continues in verse 36. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. What a thing to say. A man's foes shall be they of his own household. Does that not sound like an echo of this verse from the gospel of Mark? Mark 6, 4. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in what? <laughs> his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. A man's foes shall be of his own household household. You see, wherever the word of God is proclaimed, there will be dissension and there will be division. You can count on that. Does the word of God itself create the division? Let me ask it this way. Do you suppose that the Lord desires factions and families and fighting among friends? Would that be his desire? Is that what he really wants? I think we all know the answer is, of course not. The word of God doesn't create the division, folks. The word of God simply exposes the division. And the reason for that is because it's impossible to be neutral toward truth when truth is proclaimed. You either believe God's truth and take God at his word concerning it, or you don't. There's no middle ground where the truth of God is concerned. That's why when truth is proclaimed, there will always be friction because those who believe it and those who reject it will be pitted one against the other. It's the old Amos principle in action, as I like to think of it. <clears throat> Amos 3.3. 3. Can two walk together except they be, next word, agreed. You want to reduce the friction and eliminate the dissension? What would be the simple solution to that? Simply stop proclaiming the truth God reveals in his word, rightly divided, and the dissension disappears. Do you know this is precisely the approach that, may have taken, uh, that many have taken today? They just avoid the truth. We can avoid the friction by avoiding the truth. Uh, when we do that, of course, doctrine gives way to what might be called the agreeably gray pablum uh, of emotionalism. Doctrine ceases to govern the intellect as emotion becomes the governor. Uh, what would the Lord have us do? <clears throat> well, tell me if you can catch the mind of the ascended Christ as Paul reveals his mind in these passages relative to the preaching of sound doctrine for this dispensation. Romans 15, 6. That ye may with what? One mind in one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Single-mindedness in the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, I plead with you, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all, here it is, speak the same thing. And that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be, notice it, perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of, what's it say here? One mind. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Philippians 1, 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs. That ye stand fast in, here it is again, one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. That would be the gospel of Christ, uh, of course. Ephesians 4.13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Does it sound to, to you like truth is relative to the Apostle Paul? I think not. Do any of these verses sound to you like the Lord would have us avoid truth in order to avoid friction? Or does it sound more like our ascended Savior would have us continue to proclaim the truth of the gospel 
and God's word rightly divided in love, of course, as, as Paul tells us, with the hope that others would come to rejoice with us in that which God and we hold to be true. In the text we want to examine today, and we continue to set the stage for our journey through the Bible series, Paul's going to contrast the acceptance of truth with the rejection of truth. And there's some ramifications on both sides. He's going to do that by holding up the Thessalonian believers on one hand. They were the truth receivers in this passage. And the Jewish unbelievers or truth rejectors uh, on the other hand. If Paul is our pattern, pleasing men was not his ultimate concern. If pleasing men meant withholding the truth of God, the truth that God had revealed to him and sent him to reveal to the world. Bringing others into truth was the goal of the Apostle Paul. And it should be the goal, uh, our goal as well, as we are ambassadors of the message of grace. Let's take a quick look. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, the thrust of Paul's prayer life, because when ye received the word of God, truth, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh where? Also in you that believe. This is the statement about the truth working in us. Now, I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity. Well, let me rephrase that. I think I said it wrong. Uh, I know you've had the opportunity. I don't know if you've ever taken advantage of the opportunities you've had to share the gospel of the grace of God with uh, someone who may be holding uh, fast to what they believe to be true, but which may not be truth at all. Some of you have, and... Uh, and you've uh, shared with me your frustration when you try to do that. What is the gospel of Christ, by the way? Let's quickly mention it. 2 Corinthians 5, if you want to mark any place in your Bible, mark 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21, because this is the gospel. I'll say it again for those listening by uh, way of the media world. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21. Let's just go there very quickly here. Uh, marvelous passage and one that I think... Uh, we really should all have memorized if we memorize anything in Scripture because this is the gospel of salvation. This tells us what was accomplished when Christ died for our sins. Let's take a quick look at verses 18. Well, we can go back here. Um, and all things are of God, who hath already reconciled us. I don't have it on the board. Who hath already reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And he's given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, you'll not see that on the overhead, but that's all right. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. So God has already reconciled us to himself. And he's given to us this ministry of reconciliation. What is it, Paul? To wit, which means that is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the entire world unto himself, not counting, not reckoning, not imputing, not charging them with their sins. Why is God not charging the sins of the world to the world of sinners? Now we know religion, Satan's ministers of righteousness would say, he is. You must do the right thing, go to the right place, see the right person in order to get God to stop reconciling those sins to you. That's not what the truth of the word of God tells us. The truth of the word of God tells us he's not charging men with their sins any longer. Why not? Well, verse 21 tells you why. For he, God the Father, made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin for you. Christ who had no sin, so that, purpose clause, you might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. How do you get to be in Christ? By believing that Christ took that sin issue off the table of God's justice at Calvary. That places you into Christ. And it's the Holy Spirit that does that, performs that transaction, that spiritual judicial transaction. Modern day religion, as Paul calls ministers of righteousness, teaches precisely the opposite. God is charging you with your sins, and you must do something to take care of that sin problem. I call that forgiveness on the installment plan. And just about everybody has that idea in their minds. But try to share the gospel, and you'll find that it's going to be frustrating at the very best, because people want to think that something must take place, something further must take place. To, to resolve that issue of sins between them and God. Now, notice Paul's frustration as he shared the gospel of Christ. Acts 19.10. Here Paul said, And this continued by the space of two years. He was preaching there. So that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Did they just hear that Jesus was a man who lived and died? 
was crucified, claimed to rise again? Or did the folks in Asia hear what Christ accomplished where their sins are concerned when he died for those sins? But something was very frustrating to our apostle because now the apostle has to tell Timothy some sad news. The sad news we see in 2 Timothy 1.15. This thou knowest, Timothy, that all they which are in Asia be, next words, turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. You see, most folks have some preconceived notions concerning issues such as sin, righteousness, and judgment. Uh, the problem is, men have also had a problem when it comes to that issue of truth. So they hang on to these preconceived notions. Uh, it's been that way since the garden. Lucifer offered Eve a convincing, uh, we might say a very compelling argument as she saw it, to believe his lie rather than to believe the truth of God uh, as God had stated it. Eve bought into what she thought at that time was truth. Adam, on the other hand, knew better. Uh, that notwithstanding, he chose to follow Eve's lead rather than to adhere to the truth that he knew. And in so doing, Adam was demonstrating his problem with adhering to truth. Men have had that problem ever since, folks. Scripture tells us that nations, the nations that followed on the hills of Adam changed the truth of God into a lie. As the problems with the truth of God just continued on. Uh, Satan hasn't changed his tactics in that regard. Uh, he is called the father of liars in Scripture. The father of all lies. Satan's aim through ministers of righteousness today, according to the Apostle Paul and God's word, is to divert men's minds away from truth. And his argument is just as convincing, just as compelling to people today when it comes to the gospel of grace of God uh, as it was for Eve back in the garden. Satan has no less influence over men's minds today than he had over Eve's mind in the garden. Satan's argument today delivered through those who Paul calls, again, ministers of righteousness, contains the reality of sin and the truth of required righteousness. Is that wrong? You see, Satan's argument doesn't begin with that which is false. The reality of sin is true, is it not? How about required righteousness? Is that not also a reality? Is that not true? Sure it is. Is, re is righteousness not required for heaven? Of course it is. Truth again. Satan starts with truth. He begins with truth. And ministers of righteousness are preaching truth thus far in their messages as they stay with what we've just said. But then the truth is changed into something else. What's it changed into? A lie. Satan and ministers doing his bidding, some of them, most of them, I think, without even knowing they're doing so, would have you believe that you are not righteous in the eyes of God. That's also true. They would have you believe that you must become righteous in the eyes of God. Truth again. But they would change the truth into a lie by instilling the idea in men's minds that they can merit that righteous standing before God by way of their performance. Uh, truth changed into a lie. Justification does not come by way of performance. It comes by way of what? Belief. If you've ever shared the gospel with someone and watched the light bulbs go off in that person's mind as that individual accepted the gospel, you have an idea of the rejoicing that Paul was doing in our first Thessalonian passage. It's a joy like none other. How many of you know what I'm talking about because you've shared the gospel with someone and you've seen the light bulbs come on, go off and come on rather in their minds? Um, Paul's going to give us four results of truth that's received from the word of God. Here's the first. Truth received results in rejoicing before God. Uh, this is what Paul's thankfulness before the Lord without ceasing was all about. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, Paul said. Truth received. For what cause? Because as Paul goes on to say, they had received the word of God as it was the truth. Paul was rejoicing in, in these folks' acceptance of the truth. Paul didn't abandon truth to maintain peace with men. Um, Paul proclaimed truth in a loving manner, as we said earlier, that others might come to understand peace with God. That was far more important, a far more important issue to Paul than maintaining peace with men. How important is peace, peace with a person? If the peace you wish to maintain with that person precludes relaying the message that can save that person from being sent to hell. Um, of course, as we've been saying, we have to be wise about how we proclaim the message of truth. Uh, we don't want to give folks cause 
to reject the message that we proclaim. Sometimes we're guilty of that very thing. But to see someone abandon what they had thought was truth and come into a saving knowledge of the finished and all-sufficient crosswork of Jesus Christ, salvation that comes through faith alone, through grace alone, in the finished crosswork of Christ alone, to have resolved the issue of God's justice once and for all where sins are concerned is to understand Paul's rejoicing. Um, the acceptance of truth results in rejoicing before the Lord. That's the first thing Paul points out in this passage. The same rejoicing held true when it came to truth received in the earthly kingdom program. John expressed it this way in 3 John verse 4. I have no greater joy, there it is, than to hear that my children, what? Walk in truth. Walking in truth, by the way, is the same thing as walking in light, as Scripture has it. Rejecting the truth, unbelief, is what walking in darkness is all about. Make it a goal to keep sharing the gospel of Christ until someone accepts it. it, And you'll uh, experience firsthand how acceptance of truth brings rejoicing before the Lord. Uh, You'll be anxious to share again and again uh, what you know to be true. Secondly, we see that truth received brings pleasure to God. How so? Well, notice verse 13 once again. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which ye heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. So the word of God must be the fuel that fuels the intellect, the mind, uh, not our emotions telling us which way to go and we're swayed uh, every which way, what we think ought to be right. And I see this all the time with Bible studies, and you've heard it too, where a group gets together and they put the Bible down and they go to a passage in Scripture and they say, well, what does that mean to you? Well, what does that mean to you? And they go around the room like what it means to everybody is just as valid as what God wanted it to mean when he wrote it. So it's what God's meaning is, what his intention is, that's important. Not what it means to us, what he wants it to mean to us, and what he intended it to mean. So these folks had heard Paul, and even though Paul was doing the speaking, in their minds it was God who was doing the talking, and they believed that it was coming from God. Paul said that his message was given to him by the arisen, ascended Lord, and they believed him. Uh, By believing Paul, they were taking God at his word, because the apostle Paul as God's spokesman for this dispensation of grace, according to the Bible itself. I am the apostle of the, what's the next word? Gentiles, you know the passage. Uh, So God raised up a new apostle. Uh, The 12 were apostles to the 12 tribes of Israel. But God raised up a new apostle for the Gentiles called the apostle Paul. So the saints in Thessalonica received the truth, which brings pleasure to God. And this is an interdispensational truth, folks. Uh, let me show you where we find that. Notice Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. If I've got it on here. Uh, there it is. Without faith, it's impossible to do what? Please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is God, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. What is faith? Well, faith is simply taking God at his word. It's as simple as that. Uh, What is God's word during this dispensation of grace? It's the word spoken (coughs) by the risen, ascended Christ to the apostle of the Gentiles, the apostle Paul. Faith today is acknowledging the words Christ spoke from heaven as being the truth of God for this dispensation of grace. Christ's ministry on the earth, as Christ said himself, was to the nation Israel to confirm the promises that God gave to Israel. Uh, And so... Without faith, it is impossible to believe God. Obviously, taking God at his word does what? It pleases God, as we've just said. Unfortunately, people are told today that they can please God by a whole lot of other things. And uh, most of which go directly contrary to Paul's gospel. Uh, Things such as adhering to a list of do's and don'ts. That'll please God. Or by participating in certain religious rites and rituals. That'll please God. Folks are being told today that God is pleased when we love him. Now think about that for a moment. Sounds good on the surface, does it not? I certainly hope that you do love the Lord. Uh, Don't misunderstand me here, but tell me, did the author of Hebrews say without love for the Lord, it is impossible to please him? And you'll not find find that in the Apostle Paul's epistles either. Of course, loving the Lord is a wonderful thing. We all understand that. But understand, apart from taking God at his word concerning what Christ accomplished... Where our sins are concerned, when he died for the sins at Calvary, uh, 
called the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, all the love for the Lord that you can possibly muster is meaningless. It won't do you a bit of good. Love for the Lord is no one's ticket to heaven. It's taking the Lord at his word from heaven concerning what his love for us through the expression of his cross work on our, our behalf accomplished for us where our sins are concerned that results in right, a righteous standing before God. It's righteousness that comes by way of faith. This is what pleases God as we've seen from the book of Hebrews. This is truth no matter the dispensation. Without faith it is impossible to please him. There are a lot of folks out there who proclaim a love for the Lord. I'm sure you've heard it. I've heard it. I happen to know many of these folks. And I love them. But unfortunately, these same folks who are proclaiming a love for the Lord have bought into the lie of Satan's ministers of righteousness. And who, who I can tell you from firsthand experience reject the truth of God that Paul taught when he said in Romans 4, 5, But to him that worketh not, for what? Righteousness before God. But to him that worketh not, but believe on him that justifieth, who does it say here? The ungodly. That person's faith is counted for, next word, righteousness. Righteousness doesn't come by way of, of, of uh, behavior. Righteousness comes by way of belief, according to the Apostle Paul. This is truth from God's word. Uh, believe it or not, the vast majority of so-called Christendom today profess to love the Lord on one hand, while rejecting what Christ's cross work accomplished where their sins are concerned on the other. They're practicing sin management, as one person told me. I call it forgiveness on the installment plan. A little here, a little there. Continually getting forgiveness for what Christ took off of the table of God's justice at Calvary. It's the gospel Paul preached that's the power of God into salvation today. Think of all the songs and the hymn, hymn books across the land. The hymn books of religion that focus on our love for the Lord rather than upon his love for us. We love you, Lord. Sung over and over again. Oh, how I love Jesus is one with which we're, we're all familiar. I couldn't begin to name them all. And these songs are often sung with great fervor and emotion. But the truth is the vast majority of religiondom is in no more agreement with Paul's gospel than Satan's ministers of righteousness who are counterfeiting that gospel today. <coughs> Pardon me. These may seem like harsh words. Uh, but let's be honest. Is it the expression of our love for him or is it his expression of his love for us as demonstrated at Calvary? Uh, and it's justice resolving accomplishments where our sins re are concerned that saves a person. Where did Paul focus his message? On love for the Lord? Apart from the belie believing the gospel concerning our Lord called the gospel of Christ? It may provide wonderful fodder for the emotions. But to say that that pleases God? Not according to scripture. Not according to Paul. And not according to truth. Uh, you've just read it for yourself. Without faith. Without taking God at his word concerning what Christ accomplished for you at Calvary. Is what again? It's impossible to please him. Receiving the truth of God for this dispensation of grace. As presented by the apostle. God appointed to dispense it. Brings pleasure to God. That's the second result of receiving truth. It results in rejoicing before God. It also results in God being pleased. As we've just seen. The saints at Thessalonica were introduced to truth. And they were willing to listen to that truth. Ponder it. And then accept it as being true. Uh, they considered what they heard. And reflection became faith for those folks. As they took God's word as being the truth that God's word claims that it is. Receiving truth brings rejoicing before God. Receiving truth brings pleasure to God. Here's the third result of receiving truth. Receiving truth effectually works inside the believers who receive it. Verse 13 ends with these words. And we'll put them on the board. Which effectually worketh also where? in you that believe. How many people do you suppose have a Bible? Or perhaps several Bibles in their home? Yet never take God at his word concerning 2 Timothy 2.15. As God through Paul tells us to do what? Study it. You know the verse. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. Be interesting if Paul had said going to church to show thyself approved unto God. But that's what many people think today. Uh, the more often we're there, if we're there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, in some denominations, then, boy, we're really showing our love for the Lord. How many folks do you suppose actually read the Bible themselves? You know what the Bible becomes to some of these folks? To some of them, it becomes nothing more than a good luck charm. A good many soldiers carry them. 
little pocket New Testaments, you've seen them, you hear stories about how a Bible stopped a bullet and such things as that. Is that not using the Bible as a good luck charm? Sure it is. Uh, not in every case, of course, but there are certainly some who actually read their Bibles and there are those who actually study their Bibles. But I think you know what I'm talking about here. Sort of like having that suction sign on your window. Uh, remember those in time past, little suction things that stuck on your window? Um, baby on board. Is that not a sort of a good luck charm? Well, that's going to keep you safe. You've got a sticker that says baby on board. Now everybody's going to drive safe that's around you. Or the bumper sticker, God is my co-pilot. Oh, that'll do it. That'll keep you safe. <laughs> Why not just close your eyes and let him drive? Why put him in the co-pilot seat? Let him be the pilot. You see, superstition knows no boundaries. There's an abundant amount of it in the area of religion, by the way. And sadly enough, even what is called within what is called right division. Uh, where again does the word of God, according to the Apostle Paul, um, occur? Well, let's allow Paul to answer it. Uh, what does it say? Uh, which effectually worketh in your car? No. <laughs> which effectually worketh in your home? No again. Which effectually worketh in your pocket? Around your neck? The answer is no a third and fourth time. Which effectually worketh where? Inside you. Inside those who do what? Believe, according to Paul. The words effectually worketh are just one word in the Greek, by the way. It's the word energeo. Energeo. Uh, it's, it's, it's a word that we derive another word. Uh, we've actually carried it across uh, in the English. What word would we get from energeo? Energy. <laughs> the word of God will energize you. You see, uh, God works in our lives through the dynamic of his written word. That's what we've just learned there. We like to say it's the word of God that does the work of God in our lives. Does Paul give us another result of receiving truth? Yes, he does. Sitting in verse 14. Let's quickly look. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. Result number four of receiving truth. Truth received results in temporary suffering. Change the truth into a lie. And this is the message you'll hear. Receiving truth results in a life of happiness and harmony, as all your problems will disappear, and you'll now be able to enjoy the health, wealth, and prosperity that God was just waiting to pour down upon you. Well, he'll become your Santa Claus in the sky. <laughs> and you know the song, Life Can Be a Dream, Sweetheart. Um, crew cuts. <laughs> it just came to my mind. You tell me, have Satan's ministers of righteousness exchanged the truth uh, for this dispensation into a lie? Uh, it, or exchanged it for a lie? It's not very exciting to hear that receiving truth results in suffering, is it? You're not going to take a lot of, make a lot of money with this message. The certainty of suffering isn't a tantalizing message to believers. But it's the truth nonetheless. 2 Timothy 3.12 Yea, and all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer what? Persecution. If you believe Paul's gospel, and you come to understand how to rightly divide the word of truth, and you try to explain or proclaim either one of those, you'll likely become a member of the NFL according to my wife. <laughs> uh, what's the NFL stand for in this case? The No Friends Left Club. <laughs> uh, someone asked him, what way did these saints in Thessalonica become followers of the churches which were in Judea? Returning to 1 Thessalonians 2.14 for a moment, Paul said, for ye brethren became followers, followers of the churches of God which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. Know how Paul, now notice how Paul qualified the manner in which these body of Christ saints at Thessalonica became followers of the saints in Judea. They both shared something in common, as Paul goes on to explain. What was it? For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. Receiving truth, no matter the dispensation, no matter the program of God, results in suffering. In what sense? Suffering in the sense of persecution from those who reject that truth. This goes back to truth being the great divider of men. We've all seen fractures in families and factions among friends where Pauline truth is rejected. We have some time left, so having looked at four results of receiving truth, let's, let's quickly take a look at four results of not receiving the truth. Result number one. Whereas receiving tr the truth results in rejoicing before God, rejecting truth brings rebellion against God. 
We find this in verses 14 and 15. We'll take a quick look. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have the Jews, Gentile believers, raising havoc with, uh, or Gentile unbelievers, raising havoc with Gentile believers of Paul's gospel, just as the Jewish believers uh, suffered at the hands of the Jewish Christ rejectors in their day. Now verse 15, who both killed the Lord Jesus, see rebellion against God, and their prophets, and have persecuted us. If you want proof of the problem that men have when it comes to the issue of truth, what did Paul just tell us about the Jewish unbelievers? Who both did what? Killed the Lord Jesus. Couldn't be much plainer than that, could it? And their own prophets. And have persecuted us, Paul said. Proof positive that unbelieving men have a problem with the truth of God. And to exchange that truth for a lie was Mel Gibson's passion of Christ. Did anyone see it? Now, don't expect it to be anything more than a whole lot of iconology. But understand it was probably a very moving portrayal of the crucifixion uh, of Jesus Christ. Um, how much time do you suppose was given to Paul's gospel in that movie? None. Ironically, a group called the Anti-Defamation League infiltrated a Christian pastor's conference where the film was being discussed. They weren't invited, but they signed up under the fabricated name The Church of Truth. And I'm sure you can, you can guess their purpose. Here's a statement. It's inflammatory to say that the Jews killed Jesus was their rant. You can't say that. Why, that's anti-Semitic. What did you, we just read from the word of truth. No, it's not anti-Semitic to say that. It's what you call truth. <laughs> uh, does unbelieving man have a problem with that, with the truth? On December 22nd, 2001, and I know that's going back a ways, but nothing's really changed, folks. The Washington Post quoted Boston University's Paula Fredrickson. This is what this Boston academic had to say. I can't think of any New Testament scholar who takes the gospel accounts of Jesus' birth to be historically reliable. Adding that, most scholars believe that Christ was not even born in Bethlehem. And they exchange the truth for a lie. Listen to Stephen speak to Jewish unbelievers as the earthly kingdom program had come to the brink of being placed on the shelf for a time in a manner of speaking. Acts 7.51 Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, just as your fathers did. You're doing the very same thing. Verse 52, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom, that just one, ye have now been the betrayers and murderers. No matter the age, rejection of the truth results in rebellion against God. Secondly, rejection of the truth brings displeasure to God. Notice the second half of verse 15. And they please not God. Acceptance of truth does what? Pleases God. Rejection of truth then displeases him. Furthermore, Paul goes on to illustrate rejection of truth works in a negative sense toward all men. Jews and Gentiles alike. We're going to show that. Do you think those who are attacking the passion or were attacking the passion of Christ had the Jews' best interests in mind? Paul states there in verse 15. 15, and they please not God. Now notice the rest of his sentence in verse, 30, uh, verse uh, 15 there. And are contrary to how many? All men. Whereas acceptance of the truth energizes as God works in believers, rejection of the truth works in a precise opposite manner. It works contrary to all men. How so? How does rejection of the truth work contrary to all men? Well, not only does it result in persecution, all believers face it to some extent by family and friends who are unbelievers. It, point number three, works to keep unbelievers in unbelief. How does that take place? Have you noticed how Christianity is portrayed by the mainstream media in our day and to our young people? To those who have yet to hear, much less understand and believe Paul's gospel. Of course, the Christ rejectors of our day are... Uh, paint everybody who names Christ, whether they believe, be believers of Paul's gospel or not, with the same brush and the same paint. According to Family Research Council President Tony Perkins, in an article dated April 12th, 2013, evangelical Christianity is at the top of the government's list when it comes to those groups posing the greatest threat to homeland security. Wow. I'll quote from a portion of Tony's statement. The, the controversial army briefing titled Extremism and Extremist Organizations was given to a reserve unit in Pennsylvania. 
A slide titled Religious Extremism listed organizations and movements such as the Muslim Brotherhood, Al-Qaeda, Hamas, the Nation of Islam, the Ku Klux Klan, and Christian Identity as examples. However, the very first group on the list is Evangelical Christianity. Sad, isn't it? I'm sure those things aren't lost on a lot of you folks. 2009 Department of Homeland Security memo identified Christian and evangelical groups as potential threats to national security. And they're at the top of the list. The U.S. Military's Academy's Combating Terrorism Center released a study linking pro-lifers to terrorism. And a Fort Leavenworth war game scenario identified Christian and evangelical groups as potential threats. Lawrence Krauss, a physicist and professor at Arizona State University, even today, states that teaching creationism instead of evolution is child abuse and that it mirrors the tactics of the Taliban. Where are we going in our society as we've moved away from that one word called, starts with T, <laughs> truth. You think that the Christ rejectors of our day are not working overtime to keep unbelievers in unbelief? Well, let's look at result number four when it comes to rejecting the truth of God. This one's found in verse 16. Rejection of truth will result in the judgment of God. Verse 16. 1 Thessalonians 2.16 Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. To fill up their sins always for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. There it is in the second half of 16. For the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. What wrath? Well here Israel was under the judgment of God. And they were under that judgment when God... Now, when Paul penned this statement, not only had their program been placed on hold for a time, as we're told, but the final part of Paul's statement is very telling, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. In other words, there was no way out for those folks, as Paul wrote this epistle. No way out for unbelieving Israel to escape the final, what we call the fifth installment the fi in the fifth courses of curses promised back in Leviticus 26 in connection with their refusal to acknowledge their failure under the law contract. The judgment of God uh, is sure, folks, upon what? Not upon the sins that Christ paid for at Calvary, but upon that word called unbelief, rejection of the truth of God. To reject God's truth is serious business to God. I know a lot of people have problems with this today. Keep in mind the unjust in this dispensation are those who have not been justified or righteousified, as I like to say it, by being placed into the person of Christ, which comes by way of accepting the truth of God's word, accepting Paul's gospel. The unjust are those who reject the truth of the word of God. I might not like the idea of a resurrection of the unjust, but um, it's a resurrection that will indeed take place according to the word of God, and nothing but the great white throne judgment awaits those folks. But my emotional opposition will in no way erase the scriptural reality of that event. I want you to notice a passage from Paul's second letter to these saints at Thessalonica. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, you folks in Thessalonica, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through, or by way of what? Sanctification of the Spirit, being set apart as being in Christ, and belief of the truth. God's word is truth. Uh, and this is where we're going to take it, uh, where we're going to leave it, I should say, until our next study. But the Bible is the truth. The Bible is and, and studied in the manner in which God gave us to study it, which is rightly divided, of course. What is that truth? When Christ stood in your place at Calvary and mine, he became our substitute. When Christ stood in your place and mine, in the place of the entire world at Calvary, according to the word of truth, he took upon himself how many sins? The sins of all the world. He took the sins of the entire world upon himself at Calvary. Now let's use the old illustration we used to use here. And we've used it many, many times. Let's let this re left hand represent you. This is you. Let's let this piece of paper represent the story of your entire life. Here's where we would say you were conceived. <laughs> Here's where you'll take your last breath on planet earth. We're all walking along in the story of our lives. Some of us a little further this way and some of us a little further this way. Some of us somewhere in the middle. But we're all walking along in the story of our lives. Now let's let my right hand represent God. God loves you. God wants you with him uh, through eternity future. When this comes about, this last breath, where does he want you? He wants you in heaven with him. 
but there's something that stood in the way of you being in heaven, something that's on this paper, and it would be the black marks, and what are they called? What do we know they are? Sins, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned. Oh, we can look back in our lives and not agree with God. Have we not all come short of doing the right thing? That's the meaning of the word sin. Well, of course we have, but the Holy Spirit changes the verb tense. All are continually, constantly coming short of the glory that belongs to God himself. We have a problem because nothing that comes short of him is going to be in heaven with him. He can't dwell with iniquity, the Bible says. As a pastor told me years ago, no lies going to enter heaven. So the black marks are on everybody's paper, and they will be because we have a sin nature from here to here. What are we going to do to take care of this? Well, religion, and I don't care what denomination or what religious persuasion, religion would say, ask for forgiveness on the installment plan and God will take out his big eraser and he'll just erase that portion. Problem with that is my pile of erasure dust would be beyond the ceiling. And so would yours because we continually come short of the glory that belongs to God. If I had to get forgiveness for every time today, every time within the past 20 seconds that I've come short of who God is in his righteousness, could I ever get off my knees or open my eyes? You see, we have a problem because we have a sin nature. And that results, the sin disease results in symptoms called sins, coming short of the right thing to do according to God. So what are we going to do to take care of this? My original thinking was get back to the Ten Commandments and follow the Bible as closely as I can. But the Bible says, according to the works of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. By the law was the knowledge of what? Sin. So what are we going to do about this sin problem when God would have us be here with him and this would block the way? Well, the reality is we don't do anything. God did it. God did it all for us. He sent his son. Let his son represent my right hand who came sinless, God in the flesh, no sin of his own to die for. And he took the sins of the world, now these are yours, remember, he took the sins of the world upon himself at Calvary. He died for those sins, he was buried, putting those sins out of God's sight forevermore, and he rose again the next day as proof positive that what, belongs to, that what he did for your sins was satis, uh, satisfied the justice of God forevermore. If there was one of your sins yet future that Christ didn't pay for at Calvary, he'd still be in the ground paying for that sin. He rose as God's ironclad guarantee that God was satisfied. It's the Bible word propitiation for every sin that he died for. How many sins of yours did he die for? How many sins of yours were future when he died? Every single one of them. He had to know what they'd be. That's his omniscience. And the moment you take God at his word concerning what Christ did for you, the Bible says... God takes his son's righteousness and credits your account in heaven with, your son, with his son's righteousness. So how does God see you? Once you've believed the gospel of the grace of God and what, what Christ accomplished where your sins are concerned. He sees you as being made the righteousness of God. How? In Christ. You're baptized into Christ. According to Paul, you've put on Christ. You didn't feel it. You didn't see it. You didn't sense it. You wouldn't know it took place unless you read the word of truth and saw that's indeed what happened to you when you took God at his word. That Christ resolved the sin issue once for how many times? All, according to the word of truth. I hope you believe that. It's a simple thing. God didn't make salvation hard. He didn't make it a list of rules and regulations. He didn't say, go to this place, go to that place, go to this man, go to that man, and we can take care of the sins. The man who took care of sins was the God-man, Jesus Christ, and he took care of all of them at Calvary. We still sin, but those sins are paid for by Jesus Christ, and that's rejoicing when we understand, and that's liberating, that's freedom. The truth shall set you free. That's freedom to know that he did for us what we could never ever do for ourselves in a million years of life and religion on planet Earth. Thank you for joining with us in your endeavor to discover the truths in God's Word. Pastor and teacher Kirk Christ and the entire fellowship of Welcome to Grace Ministries would like to thank you for your support of this ministry of grace. If you're enjoying the teachings and want to share with others, please write us at Welcome to Grace Ministries, P.O. Box 90, Penrose, North Carolina, 
28766. You may call us toll free at 877-770-7098 or visit us on the web at www.welcometograce.com. Again, thank you for joining us and we look forward to hearing from you.